for joining me again for your reading chapter 3 of The Scarlet Rider by Luna Chai. You'll have to forgive me for not knowing how to set the screen up. I imagine this is what we'll just use from now on. And also apologies for once again, as always, being bone dry uh, during every read. But let us let us go forth. Um, as you can see, my face is still on screen. As you can see, the book is also on screen. Um, maybe at some point this will change, but for now, this is what we're going with. Let us continue. So, chapter three. Haven. It was a short walk back to the Hunter's Guild, but every step ached. Azalea grimaced as she dragged herself down the beaten path, her limbs creaking and her skull pounding. Her manawa was dry as a desert, perfectly matching the parched tongue that stuck to the roof of her mouth. She hadn't felt this exhausted since her first day at the Academy. And this mission was supposed to be easy. Those wolves had only been class one, corrupted beasts that had survived a single storm. They were hardly the strongest that the world had to offer. Back at the guild, Azalea had been regaled with stories of class five beasts. Such creatures, her seniors claimed, loomed over the very heavens. Impervious plates covered every inch of pelt and hide, Mana submitted to their will, forming deadly abominations or shaping the ground. Even a single glance into their eyes would turn your body to stone. Azalea wasn't sure how much color had been added onto the facts, but she wasn't keen on finding out. There was a reason why only the top hunters were assigned to such monstrosities. They were the only ones who could come back alive. Within the hour, Ailey's capital rose from the horizon, bold and bright beneath the sparkling sun. Azalea heard the, <clears throat> the lowing toll of the midday bell, hailing fishing ships from the sea into the bustling port, ushering merchants beneath the wings of the market, and rotating the city watch patrolling the ramparts. Despite the dangers looming at its doorstep, it was a civilization that refused to extinguish, forever blazing with the light of a thousand mana lamps. It was Mythaven, her pride, her duty, and her home. Azalea passed wide swathes of fields which were seeded with crops and attended by workers toiling beneath wide-brimmed hats. Such estates were owned and operated by alien nobility, responsible for most of the city's food. While they lacked the safety of the Mythaven Wall, set out in the open beneath the ravenous gazes of corrupted creatures, they were far from defenseless. The fields were offered protection by the royal hunters, in exchange for the king's tax, of course. Whether by brigand or beast, ruin would not befall the precious food that grew beneath the soil. Azalea drew closer to Mythaven's frontal gatehouse, which commanded both elegance and power in its towering stature, beautiful latticed portcullis and crowning decorative arches. Two guards stood at attention just outside, paying careful heed to the thin trail of merchants and artisans bustling in and out. One of them snapped his feet together with a rattle of metal and saluted her smartly. Lady Hunter Fairwind, ma'am, the guard said sharply. She flinched the little letter's volume, which was much louder than necessary. Welcome back, ma'am. Good to see you're not dead, ma'am. Thank you, she said. She paused, unsure. It's good to not be dead. I can imagine that, ma'am, said the guard solemnly. Lying in a grave doesn't sound particularly interesting, ma'am. On that cheery note, he promptly stepped aside, and Azalea passed through. 
The little throng of people at the gatehouse parted for her like a creek over stones, murmuring quietly among themselves. A hunter. In the flesh. A royal hunter. Their whispers were reverent, almost fearfully so, and they strained to catch a glimpse of the shield emblem on her armor. Zalia tried to pay it little mind. Just weeks ago, she'd been another fumbling student at the Knights Academy. Other hunters deserved such adoration and praise. But not her. She was barely functioning after a basic commission. Azalea pulled her hood up, lowered her face, and pressed quickly through the gatehouse. The weight of all the eyes on her was suffocating. And if she headed to the guild from here, it would only get worse. She'd have to trek through Mythaven's main streets, which were constantly abuzz with crowds of merchants, citizens, and soldiers. Hmm. Maybe she could take a little detour. Just this once. The southeast corner of Mythaven was quieter, quainter, an older part of town where merchants still set up their wagon stores in the Fountain Square, where lines of drying laundry were still strung across rooftops, and where the old gallows had been repurposed into a community stage for public theatre. This part of the citadel still bustled with life, but it was a different kind of liveliness than uptown. The warm greetings of families who had known each other for generations, the loud bargaining calls from housewives who knew how to push the worth of vegetables, and the festive plucking of a lutist, perched on a nearby barrel, hat laid out for loose change. Azalea breathed in the briny odor of fresh fish as she passed the wagon stalls blooming with produce and animal goods. She paused in front of an arrangement of breads and pastries, her eyes drifting past knots of spiced dough to the milk buns nestled in their greased wrappers. An elderly woman hunched behind the display, smiled toothily at her. Well, if it isn't Rachel, she croaked warmly. Will you be having your milk bun? Azalea was in fact not Rachel, but she didn't have the heart to correct Granny Mabel. She tried already about 20 times, but Granny Mabel's hearing was not particularly accommodating. Eventually, Azalea had given up. There was no harm if her name was a little off, anyway. Yes, please, she said, fetching a few coins from the small purse stood on her belt. She slid them across the counter. Granny Mabel stashed the coins and pushed not one, but two squashy wrappers at Azalea. One for your friend, she said sweetly. Azalea flushed a little as she accepted the buns. She refused to take anything for free, so she retrieved more coins for Granny Mabel. A glint entered Granny Mabel's eye. One for your mother. Two, she said cheerily, plucking two more milk buns. And your father. Azalea sighed as she pulled out more coins, plopped them on the counter, and ran from Granny Mabel before she could be buried beneath the mountain of milk buns and dirt. Granny Mabel was always something of a swindler, a devious mind beneath that sweet, harmless facade. But in a way, Azalea preferred her life like this. In Gallo Square, she was just Azalea, or Azza, or Rachel, a shy girl who could be talked to, swindled or pulled onto the stage as a last-minute pageant substitute. She knew everyone in the square by name, and they knew hers. It was far preferable to being worshipped with a title she was unfit to carry. Azalea nibbled on a milk bun as she passed Gallo Square, turning into a cramped row of squat homes with soot-speckled, shingled rooms. Sweet vanilla cream bloomed in her mouth, and she hummed a note of appreciation. Questionable business practices aside, Granny Mabel sure knew how to bake. She stopped in front of a curious house equipped with steam pipes and a smoke-bellowing chimney, 
pale slats of drywall peeking out from beneath beams of cherry wood. A wooden sign had been staked by the front door, tidy letters etched over its surface, and painted white to stand out. Where's his workshop? Experiment in progress. Enter at your own risk. At the corner of the sign, a doodle of a plushy-faced cat had been scrawled in charcoal pencil. Azalea's own handiwork. She stepped past the sign and pushed into the workshop with nary a care. Hmm. The room that welcomed her was full of quaint, unrecognizable things. Wooden walls were packed with shelves of weathered books and pocket scraps and eclectic tools, and in the center of the room stood a large table, broad and sturdy, and lofted over stacks of crates and drawers. Compared to the rest of the room, the table was kept quite orderly. Several strange contraptions lay half-finished on its surface, as wooden wire frames and golden joints, sheets of paper laid in neat stacks at their bases. Azalea caught sight of concept sketches etched in charcoal. They were visions of the future, gliders like butterfly wings, a beautifully retrofitted compass that detected mana quartz, a talking parrot made of wood that would convey messages without risk without risking storm corruption. She smiled as she drew further into the house. Where's... she called. Her throat sounded sandy and hoarse. She cleared it and tried again. <clears throat> I'm here. From behind the jutting wall, a young man emerged, a splash of forest green adding fresh color to his otherwise earthy workman's uniform. He pulled up his gold-rimmed goggles, face lighting up at the sight of her. Uh, Zaley, he said. He hurriedly set down his wrench and wiped his hand on a tattered rag. You're back. His sunshine smile eased the tension in Azalea's shoulders, calming her nerves like a gentle balm. The soft breeze through the far window, the glow of the forge, the warm welcome. This was as close to a home as she'd ever get. Hi, she said shyly. Am I interrupting anything? Wes shook his head. Actually, you came just in time, he said eagerly. Want to try out my new firing cylinder? I promise it won't explode. This time. Probably. The hesitation dropping into his tone didn't phase Azalea. Testing. Testing was always exciting, at least for her. Wes's ideas were so strange and inventive that testing his creations was like going on an adventure every time. Even when the trials resulted in failure, the process was always loads of fun. Azalea eagerly rushed into the workshop, completely forgetting about the state of her body. Her legs did not. I'm sorry. I just be chair. <laughs> Squeaks up a storm. <clears throat> she barely made it three steps before her feet gave out under her, sending her sprawling to the ground in an unseemly heap. Zaylee! Wes cried, bolting to her side. Azalea quickly pushed herself upright, wincing at the burning pain in her arms. I'm alright, she said. Just tired. Tired? Wes shifted his goggles down and frowned at her from behind their colored lenses. Tired is when you go to bed at four in the morning. This is... Your mana wall is totally shot. That's way beyond tired. It's not so bad. It's very bad. He sighed and pulled the goggles up. Mission? A simple one, Azalea said. Just class one wolves. It should have been easy. There was a tingle of shame looming in her chest. And she shrunk a little. <clears throat> Pardon. A royal hunter, overwhelmed by a basic evacuation. Disgraceful. Nothing is simple with the hunter's guild, Wes muttered, 
Just varying levels of fatal. Azalea pushed her feet against the floor, but her legs refused to move. Apparently, her body had given out. She bit her lip. Give me a hand. Oh, yeah. Wes said resignedly, and he scooped up Azalea without pause, letting her link her fingers around his neck. The added bulk of her accoutrements, with all her strapped sheaths and pauldrons and tassets, couldn't have made it easy, but at least he was used to working with metal and wood all day. Perhaps this was no different. He made his way across the room and settled her in a large, plushy chair in the corner of the workshop. Azalea liked this chair. She often nestled in it when she was practicing. On a craft, studying a hunter's duties, or just keeping Wes company. Maybe that's why he consistently kept it free of ragtag parts, unlike every other surface in the workshop. Azalea eased into the chairs. Azalea eased into the chair's plush cushion, watching as Wes stooped down to rummage in the shelving and stalled under his work table. So, how many wolves were there? He called over his shoulder. Uh, three, four. Azalea counted in her head. About... 20, I think. Wes fumbled. A small leather case in his hands dropped to the floor with a dull thud. 20? Yes. Oh, but the garrison assisted. Seven were dead by the time the evacuation concluded. Oh, yes. 13 wolves by yourself? Wes muttered. Piece of cake. Azalea frowned. Thirteen was hardly a significant number. She imagined that it was the bare minimum required of a royal hunter. They were the top fifty soldiers in the entire country after all. Disposing of, disposing of class one corruptions should be akin to disposing of vermin. I'll get better, she promised. I'm just a little too weak. Wes's expression cleared for a moment. He leaned down and scooped up the leather case. It's not a matter of skill, he said. Thirteen wolves for what? Your third mission? <sighs> They're insane. Azalea didn't say what she thought. Not right then. The guild wasn't insane. They were desperate. The kingdom was desperate, barely welded together, and as a hunter, it was her duty to protect the ones who could not protect themselves. She had an overpowering legacy to live up to. Wes returned to her and popped open the and popped o popped open the leather case. It was full of various small appliances like sterile wrappings, a cauterizing iron, and vials full of dried herbs and flowers. He retrieved a pair of light silver bracelets and held them out towards Azalea. Wear this, he said. Azalea recognized them at once as resistance inhibitors, specially made accessories that lowered a human's natural resistance to external mana craft. Several creatures, including beasts touched by the storm and humans, repelled external mana influence. That was why it was nearly impossible to reach into a person and boil the water mana in their blood, detonate the light mana in their eyes, or crush the earth mana in their bones, the fact that those were all war crimes aside. Resistance inhibitors removed that obstacle, and were most often used in the medical field to treat patients. These inhibitors looked like an expensive model, constructed to be especially slim and elegant. Their price point was, only, was accessible only by noble families. She wouldn't mention that to Wes, though not when it brought up such sour memories. Azalea accepted the inhibitors, snapping them lightly over her wrists. She nudged them with her mana well and felt them resonate in response, syncing with her unique mana flow. Good. Now they were active. Ready, she said. Wes knelt in front of her, took her hands, and closed his eyes. Azalea felt, 
A thread of mana passed from the tips of his fingers up her arm, knitting her flesh together with a warm, refreshing touch, like sunshine on mint. She felt the tension bleed out of her shoulders and eased into the chair with a languid sigh. Her injuries were far from life-threatening, but she hadn't realized how much they'd hurt until the pain was leached away. Wes moved on, soothing the pounding ache in her shoulders. He was thorough and patient as he proceeded down, easing a bruised rib, sealing a bleeding scrape on her knee, and warming her legs, relieving the knots of pain up her calves and thighs. It was blissful, it was lovely, and it was using far too much mana. Where's your mana well? Azalea urged. Wes didn't respond, but his fingers squeezed hers reassuringly as the mana continued to flow. Azalea frowned. Accelerated rege- ex- Oh my gosh. Accelerated regeneration was no simple matter, nor was it mana efficient. It was an advanced form of threading, a mana craft known to imbue and manipulate certain objects with magical behaviours. Azalea wasn't too familiar with threading. It was by far her weakest craft, and the Academy had breezed over the subject as was their right. Threading was a preparatory skill, and saw very little use in active combat, but they had briefly mentioned the complexities of accelerated regeneration, often referred to simply as regen. Mainly, Azalea knew that regen involved manually altering the human body with mana. When Wes was closing her wounds, he was essentially using his mana well to control her body's cells in a localized area and magically stimulate the healing process. With the wrong touch, her body would re reject the invading mana and throw up a mana, a mana immune response, causing her to seize up, cough or wretch until the corruption had disappeared. And it was far too easy to apply the wrong touch. Every human body was unique carrying different properties, different affinities, and different reactions. All Academy officers had been strictly warned against attempting untrained regen for that exact reason. Wes, of course, had always been an exception. As a son of the influential Jeppet family and a talented threader, he had easily earned his emergency care license during their academy days. He had been kind enough to patch up Azalea more times than she could count. Alright. Wes murmured, and he finally stepped away. Azalea felt the mana trail in her body dissipate. I'm no physician, but that's the best I can do. Azalea experimentally rolled her shoulders. It wasn't really necessary, but she knew that the motion would put Wes at ease. Sure enough, there was no pain. Not even an aching soreness. <sighs> Wes had been very thorough at the cost of a great deal of mana. Thank you, she said, beaming at him. It's perfect. Your practice is paying off. A light flush of pleasure bloomed over Wes's cheek and crawled up to his ears, which Azalea had always considered rather endearing. <clears throat> well, he said. Good. Very good. <clears throat> he cleared his throat. I'm glad. But don't get hurt. It seems... Uh, painful. Azalea's mouth pulled upward as Wes released the mana inhibitors and slid them back into the leather case. I'll do my best, she promised. Wes shouldn't have been wasting his mana on patching her up anyway. He wasn't a physician. His mana was better spent on engenement, the science of enchanted engineering. Using threading to imbue mana quartz with parameters, 
Ingeniators could design just about anything. Mana weapons like Azalea's star shooter, glowing lamps and light bridges, wind-powered galleons. It was the perfect occupation for a brilliant, patient boy like Wes. Now that I'm a hunter, I have access to the guild's physician, Azalea offered. I don't have to bother you anymore. Then she almost jumped. The guild? The guild master would be expecting her report. She was already terribly late. Oh, you don't have to worry about, Wes was saying, but Azalea was already on her feet, digging into her pockets until she found the squashy milk buns and... Here, from Granny Mabel, she called, flinging two buns at Wes, the last one she kept for herself. Oh, uh, thanks, Wes blurted, catching one of the buns against his chest. The other hit him squarely in the face. Wait, two? Did she scam you again? Sorry, Wes, I have to go. See you later. A red blur tore out of the workshop. The door slammed shut, rattling the books on his shelves and the wireframes on his work table. <sighs> Wes stood there alone, still clutching the milk bun to his chest. Have a nice day, he mumbled. He pressed a palm to his cheek with a sigh. It was still flushed warm. When Azalea stepped back into Gallo Square, Dark clouds were gathering overhead. The traces were small, lazy little wisps bundling up like dust bunnies above the hazy glow of the mana lamps. But still, but she still frowned. The sight made her skin prickle in a way that ordinary rain clouds never did. Something strange with those clouds, whispered her mind. A ghost, a memory. Do you feel it, Zaylee? Zaylee adjusted the star, the star shooter strap on her shoulder and walked on, melting into the bustling streets of Mythaven. The guild awaited her. So, oh. get Wes into focus. Lovely lad. Shall we? <sighs> so clumsy. Wes, an earnest inventor with a heart of gold. Wes pulls out all the stops to keep his dearest childhood friend Azalea alive. <clears throat> is is. The very picture of inventor. Anyway, sending sending Azalea forth to the guild. On to the next chapter. Time to meet new friend. Um. Uh, Let's just oh, let's just go back to this will do slim pickings <clears throat> on to chapter four Myth Haven I am parched golly do do apologize A new face here to meet. So. <clears throat> Chapter 4 The Hunter's Guild was in chaos when Azalea pushed through the doors. Chaos was nothing new. She'd only been a hunter for three weeks and she knew that much. As it turned out, when 50 of the nation's strongest fighters were tossed into the same room, thrust into a brutal, bloodthirsty schedule, and left to compete among each other for the highest stipend. 
the environment became a bit concerning. Tricks, threats, and potentially fatal sparring were an everyday occurrence. But this was a new level of chaos entirely. A pair of throwing knives whistled in from Azalea's left. She ducked just before they took off her head. They struck the wall next to her, wobbling violently with the force of the throw. There was a raucous laugh in the distance and a swig of ale. No apologies were uttered in her direction. <clears throat> Whoever had thrown the knives probably hadn't even noticed she was there. Azalea took a step forward, but that was a mistake. A damaged floorboard gave way under her foot and she caught herself by gripping a nearby chair. She proceeded through the room, this time with more caution. The guild was built more or less like a tavern. Squat, coffered ceilings with rough-hewn iron chandeliers, wooden stools set around round maple tables, and colourful refreshments arrayed, arrayed on a long counter that lined the side wall. Most of the furniture was replaced on a monthly basis due to breaking, or rather being broken, and as a result, the guild always looked new. It would have been a beautiful, cozy place if not for the surrounding chaos. The door to the guildmaster study, placed at the opposite end of the room, had never felt so far away. Ah, new girl! Caused a, a, called a boisterous voice, and a man dressed in lively green waved her over with his half-full tankard of ale. There were flowers and vines plastered all over him, like a plant-based mural, which would make him, if she remembered correctly, Jack the Beanstalk Botanist, 40th Hunter of Early. Rosie, he said. Oh, was it Candy? Or Susan? Are, are you new? New, new? Or, or new, new, new? I can't remember, you all die off so quickly. Azalea wasn't entirely sure how to respond to that. I haven't died yet, she offered practically. She ducked right as an arrow soared overhead. <clears throat> My name is Azalea. Azalea, I'll be sure to forget that. Jack gave her a lopsided salute, raised his tankard to intercept his rated throwing star. Ail sloshed out the side and poured down the metal projectile. He drank from the cup anyway as if nothing had happened. Perturbed, Azalea moved on. She kept her senses alert as she approached the guildmaster's study. On the table beside her, two men were locked in an arm wrestle with one of their hands and trying to stab at each other's throats with the other. At the refreshments counter, Several burly fighters were immersed in a drinking competition with a mysterious, potentially poisonous liquid that radiated bright blue. In the corner, two women were playing what seemed like a fast-paced shedding card game, fingers flying with every deal to the center pile, which would have seemed normal enough, were not the cards rimmed with metal and sharp enough to slice through wood. From the looks of it, they were trying to cut off each other's fingers faster than their opponent could off their cards. The job of a hunter was already so dangerous, yet here the guild members were, tempting fate even further on their time off. Azalea's own idea of vacation involved wandering around the night market on Main Avenue, or reading by the fountain of Gallows Square, or watering the herbal plants that lay on the workshop windowsill. Even when she and Wes had sparred at the academy, it was always in preparation for an exam. A necessity, not a hobby. She sometimes wondered if she was a hunter at all. Azalea ducked her head, pulled her hood further over her face, and hurried her steps. She had just reached the guildmaster's study when she heard a low whistle by her ear. Instinctively, she pivoted and watched the black gleam of a throwing axe skate just before her nose, burying into the door with a heavy sound. 
Hey, little kid. She had a strident voice from the distant corner. Watch your head. Wouldn't want to lose it now, would you? She didn't bother turning around. Striking or maiming another hunter was grounds for immediate expulsion and severe punishment. The veterans might taunt her as the newest member, but she would never face any true danger in this room. It's just your fear that they want, Zaley. Wes had told her back at the academy, back when her commoner's stench had offended the high-born nobility of her class. If you don't give them that, they can't take anything from you. Zalia raised her head high and calmly stepped around the throwing axe, pulled open the door, and slipped inside. Sorry, slim pickings. <laughs> I can't. Um, we'll, we'll just, we'll just stick with this one. <clears throat> the Guildmaster's study was the complete opposite of the main hall. Calm, quiet, and perfectly pristine. Not one sheet of paper out of place, and the mass of shelves that lined its walls. Similarly, the woman... The woman behind the stately oaken desk, Guildmaster Nicolina Cotton, as Azalea knew her, was arrayed in an immaculate uniform, a large golden badge on her lapel, denoting her station. The badge was a handsome thing, engraved with vine-like tracery, and dotted with multicolored gemstones. Azalea had read about it in one of her history classes, Garnet for Bloodshed. Sapphire for loyalty, Sunstone for justice. These were the stones that represented the three main values of the Hunter's Guild, and they were embedded proudly on the lower part of the badge. Other important government magistrates had their own unique badges and gemstones. Aquamarine for seafaring, Emerald for wisdom, Rose Quartz for harmony. The list was endless, but it made it possible for national leaders to be recognized with a simple glance at their badge. Other than the ornate emblem, Guildmaster's, Guildmaster Nicolina's attire was more or less nondescript. Her dress was clean and sharp, fastidiously kept, but lacking any jewelry or loud embellishments. She didn't seem much one for status. The entire study lacked the usual burnished lions, hunting trophies, and mounted plaques that were ordinary fair and guildmaster studies. Azalea had the distinct feeling that Nicolina had been strong-armed into wearing her badge and cloak at all. Nicolina looked up from across the desk as Azalea pushed into the room. Ah, oh, fair one, she said mildly. Congrats on returning from your third mission. I'm glad to see you're still alive. The words were hard-boiled and blunt, but there was a hint of genuine warmth. Most likely, she was honestly happy that Azalea hadn't perished in some terrible manner, if not just because it would be a nuisance to replace her. Azalea saluted sharply and from the shoulder, as was expected of all alien military personnel. Hail, Guildmaster. May I... I ask what's going on out there? Out oh, where? The main area. There was a heavy thud as the floor shook. Azalea winced. I think there's a brawl happening. A resigned look crossed Nicolina's face and she sighed. One moment, she commanded. She slid out of her chair and plodded to the door. On foot, her small stature was exposed. She was surprisingly short, barely reaching the height of her own desk. Word had it that she'd been once teased with the name Thumbelina, mocked for her naturally petite size. Then, she'd been sworn in as the right hand to the leader of the Hunter's Guild, selected for her administrative capabilities. And after his passing, she'd taken up the mantle as the Guildmaster herself. Now, the thumb was a title whispered reverently 
even among the upper ranks of the hunters. No one dared to cross the thumb, for she had tamed that which would listen to no other man. Paperwork. A hunter could take down any hulking beast without batting an eye. But reports? Bylaws? Taxes? Those were creatures that few men dared to approach, and even fewer were able to fell. Nicolina yanked open the door and kicked at the throwing axe sunk into its surface. <clears throat> The weapon fell heavily to the ground with a resonant clang and immediately the main hall hushed into silence. All eyes swiveled to the cherubic woman standing beneath the doorframe, hands on her hips. For any damages caused in the course of your shenanigans, Nicolina said sharply, the cost will be taken directly from the stipends of those responsible. Proceed at your own risk. She looked at her door and grimaced. And avoid my door, damn it. The noise it takes to install a new one is the worst. <clears throat> she shut the door and plodded back to her chair. Azalea could hear the noise resuming in the hall, but it was at a much tamer, more respectful level. There were probably less sharp objects sharp objects being bandied about. Twelve hunters, Nicolina grasped, flopping on the cushion of her chair. Only twelve hunters in reserve, and still not one moment of peace. They're all hopeless. Are they always like that? Azalea would need ways to touch her up after every mission, if so. She wouldn't have the reflexes to avoid death otherwise. Not usually. Nicolina kneaded at her temples. It's those damn clouds in the sky. Means bad business. It keeps everyone on their toes, makes them antsy. Unfortunately, they don't know how to express it any other way than spontaneous duels to the death and highly questionable hobbies. That was interesting. And nothing like Azalea's cautious, stalwart personality. The clouds shouldn't mean anything serious, Azalea said. Surges are almost never preceded by poor weather, as per the fourth omen listed in Omens of the Mythical Tempest and its Tribulations. Nicolina balked. You actually read that book? Of course. It was assigned reading at the Knight's Academy, for the class in Magic Phenomena, I think. It's so dry that it could put hardtack to shame, Nicolina said, which was probably to be expected from a book titled Omens of the Mythical Tempest and Its Tribulations, as observed by Scholastics, officially certified by the Observatorium. And it's also wrong, she continued, which you'd personally know. Azalea blinked. I would? You fought in a storm, didn't you? There wasn't much fighting. My company just stood watch. Nicolina raised her brow. Stood watch? Really? She pulled out a drawer on her desk. Small, deft fingers rang, uh, ran across, uh, ran along sheaves of paper divided by tabs, each labeled with tidy lettering. Azalea counted the number of times Nicolina's fingers hit a tab. Fifty. There were fifty sections, one for each of her current hunters. Now, Azalea wondered what all the papers in the shelves stood for. Nicolina pulled out a slim folder and snapped it straight with a flick of her wrist. Deployments on the Battle of Havenport, Methaven Academy Company, she read aloud. Captain Wesley Jeppert, Cadets, oh, here, yeah. Azalea Fairwin. She paused and looked up, tapping her finger on the paper. Is this you? Azalea flushed a little. Um, yes, she admitted. Fifty recorded kills from a student company. Impressive. Outperformed some active companies of soldiers. I suppose that's somewhat to be somewhat expected with a jeopard at the commanding of. At 
with the Jeppet as the commanding officer and the academy's top performance as his unit. Her eyes raised slowly, piercing green like summer leaves. But, do you know who has credited 35 of those 50 kills? The heat on Azalea's cheeks deepened. Personnel notice, Cadet Fairwin has attributed 35 recorded kills. Demonstrates a stabilizing rate of 15 rounds per minute with a Firefly Mark II. Highly recommended to investigate for marksman potential. Nicolina tapped her finger on the report. Do you know what the previous record for the Firefly Mark II's firing rate was, Hunter Fairwin? A, a little slower? Azalea guessed. Four rounds per minute. Nicolina leaned back, her gaze cutting. Star shooters were never seen as truly viable in combat. They were powerful, yes. Lethal? Absolutely. But viable? No. Azalea had heard as much during her time at the academy, although every cadet had taken sharpshooting lessons, in which they'd learned to aim and fire a standard issue Firefly Mark I, the instructors had actively warned against re relying on firearms. The instability from Starshooter's explosive reactions took too long to dissipate, especially in the middle of a storm, where the air was already saturated with chaos mana. Two to four rounds per minute was outclassed by a trained bowman. Combined with their ludicrous production cost, Starshooters were more of a fashion statement for the nobility than any real weapon. But something had been different that day. Surrounded by peril, and given a unit to protect, Azalea had found her aim impeccable, her focus heightened, her mana well nearly bottomless. 35 kills. She'd never heard the record like that from a non-hunter. Nicolina filed the sheet back into its proper place, and closed the drawer. You're the first hunter who has ever been recruited on the premise of stabilizing capability, Hunter Fairwin. You made what was once considered a useless mana craft look like an enviable asset. No need to downplay your achievements. Azalea's hands knitted together, white and shaking. I have high hopes for you. We all do. A breakthrough in stabilizing could change the landscape of Minecraft as we understand it. She swallowed. Yes, Guildmaster. Inside, her heart was fluttering like the wings of a dying bird. She hadn't been able to replicate the success of the Battle of Havenport. Even today, she'd struggled against, she'd struggled against fighting 20 class 1 wolves. Whatever perks stabilizing lended, they were nowhere near as reliable as forming. She couldn't form blades of darkness or waves of water on a whim. She only found success with a star shooter. And limited success at that. She hoped that Nicolina wouldn't rely on her too much. <laughs> now your combat report, said Nicolina, retrieving a fresh sheet of paper. Proceed when ready. Azalea brightened. Combat reports. That, at least, she knew. She'd learned the procedure at the Knights Academy. Westshire has been successfully evacuated, she said smartly. Citizens were directed to the nearest outpost as per protocol. Type of opposition encountered Class 1 lupus. No major deviations detected. Quantity encountered 20 specimens. Nicolina's quill slowed. She looked up at Azalea, who waited. Twenty wolves? She repeated. At Azalea's nod, her mouth tightened. The average is rising. The average? Creatures, per encounter. She waved a hand. Never mind. It's nothing you need to worry about. You did well staying alive. Nicolina asked several more questions, and Azalea gave her prepared responses. Casualties, time elapsed, mana anomalies. She considered 
reporting the appearance of the lone wolf, but decided to refrain. He may have been a suspicious figure, but he had nothing to do with the actual fighting. When the report was finished, Nicolina stamped the corner with a wax seal and slid it into Azalea's folder. Your responsibilities are growing fast, she noted. You're going to need more assistance. Are you familiar with the guild support system? Azalea straightened. The support system had been detailed in the handbook she'd received upon acceptance into the Hunter's Guild. This must be a test. Introduction, she recited dutifully. This formal agreement between the subsidized non-military partner, henceforth referred to as the support, and the serving soldier of the Royal Hunters of Airly, henceforth referred to as the Hunter, is intended to promote and produce profitable collaboration within the socio-economic structure of... Mythic's alive, Fairwin, Nicolina choked. You read the fine print? Azalea wilted. Was I not supposed to? No, it's just... There's a much simpler way of understanding than what those old farts threw in the handbook. Nicolina pulled out another drawer on her desk, raised her fingers nimbly atop the sheaves of paper within, and withdrew a single sheet. This is all they're yammering on about. As there are only 50 royal hunters in the entire kingdom, they must be kept in top condition. This is where the support system comes in. Hunters are strongly recommended Hunters are strongly recommended to enlist an associate who can support them, whether through providing goods, equipment, or services, hence the title. Strongly recommended or required? Azalea asked, surprised. She'd never seen a hunter without a support. Strongly recommended, Nicolina said grimly. If you don't want me to break your kneecaps. She slid the paper across the table with a flick of her fingers. Zalia stopped it with a quick hand, skimming the lines neatly penned on its surface. It was a written agreement for taking on a support, with ample room left on the bottom for notarized signatures. Supports are more or less substitu- Oh gosh. Supports? Yavai, yavai, yavai. <laughs> Supports are more or less subsidized, Nicolina said. In addition to your regular wage, you will receive a bonus stipend to fund your support. Originally, this was meant to assist each hunter and encourage local partnerships with citizens, but I'm really not that picky. Sign up your doctor, your blacksmith, your cousin, I don't care. As long as they're involved and they help keep you sane in this godforsaken world, they're doing their job. Azalea carefully slipped the paper into her pack without folding or rolling it. Understood. I'll carry this out at once. There's really no rush. But Azalea only snapped back to attention, saluting for good measure. To her, it was another assignment. One that she'd carry out with swiftness and pride. It wouldn't take long anyway. She already had someone in mind. One last thing before you go. Nicolina reached under her desk and withdrew a plain box wrapped with green fabric and a pale ribbon. This just came in from the armory. Your wind souls are ready. Azalea brightened, her hand snapping towards the box before she caught herself and drew back. <laughs> you can go ahead, Nicolina said amusedly. They're yours. With much more restraint this time, Azalea pulled away the ribbon and removed the lid. The prettiest pair of shoes lay within, high-topped riding boots of fine leather, trimmed with gold, identical to the form of her current shoes, but with one crucial difference. Resting on the throat of each shoe was a green-tinted mana quartz that beamed in the light, vibrant as a precious emerald. Azalea ran a careful hand over the quartz, and nudged it with her mana well. She felt the quartz resonate as it attuned to her flow. Now, she'd be the only person authorized to control these shoes. Thank you, she murmured. She
he knew how expensive wind cells were. Much like her star shooter, they required a precious, mana sensitive material. That was carefully refined over the course of months through the process of in through the process of engineering the intersection between engineering and enchantment someone like wes had spent a good bit of their year to get the wind quartz on these special shoes to work like i said they're yours nicolina said no need for thanks just don't break them i could never Azalea said. We ran lots of courses at the academy, expressly to use them properly. Courses? Nicolina echoed, raising a brow. That's quite a mild term for those hellish races. You can be honest. What did you think of them? Azalea paused. What did she think of the courses? Did it matter? They were simply another method of training. Like most of the activities at the academy. Yes, they were quite dangerous, involving sections of leaping over fire coals, running through sub zero temperatures, and dodging venomous arrows. But, unlike real life, instructors were always monitoring to prevent any actual deaths. But had she enjoyed them? Not particularly. I thought they were hard. She eventually said. They weren't very pleasant. Nicolina laughed, which sounded oddly young and spry. <laughs> Unpleasant. I have to remember that one. She waved a hand at the shoes. These are custom made by the top artisans in the country. You'll find them much more efficient than the standard issue pairs provided by the academy. Thank you. I didn't make them, so you're not welcome. Wear these from now on. It'll markedly improve your travel. Yes, Guildmaster. Dismissed. Azalea saluted at the shoulder, and that was that. The meeting had been easy, fast, and efficient, just the way Nicolina liked it. She had just turned to go, her fingers wrapping around the handle of the door, when Nicolina spoke. Hunter Fairwin she said, her voice adopting a strange edge. This field can be a lonely one. Azalea stopped short. So, I should make friends? On the contrary, you should keep it that way. Nicolina's tone softened. As you were. Frowning, Azalea slipped out of the room, putting the words out of her mind. And here we reach the end of chapter four. So, we've met some new friends. <laughs> Mainly lovely, lovely guildmaster. Nicolina, and also a delightful childhood friend, Wes, who will we, <laughs> who will be seeing plenty of soon enough. I deeply apologize for how clumsy, <laughs> clumsy my reading is, as always. Um, feel feels clumsier today <laughs> than usual, but. It's okay. Please forgive me. <laughs> now let's... Then? That is us for chapters 3 and 4. See you again next time.